ladies, I know I can see quite a few people hugging along for the parts that we recognize. Thank you, that was lovely. Um, bike riders, calling all bike riders. I'm sure some of you saw the screen this morning. If you would like to ride your bike, you are invited to join the youth on a bike ride today. We will transport people and bikes to Krieger Park in New Haven and ride the Greenway to Promenade Park and back. Meet at the church at two o'clock if you're interested. Let John and Connie Bowman know if you need help getting your bike to the church or if you need a bike to borrow. Bring the whole family for a fun ride. And we have some good news. Starting in two weeks on August 1st, we will have a Sunday school class for grades four through six. Wow. <laughs> the class will meet in the basement. Exactly, yes. So we want to say a huge thank you to Janine Carpenter for answering God's nudge to teach this class. Also, um, don't forget to sign up in the fellowship hall if you can help pack rice meals. The rice meals will be packed on September 19th. That's the day. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Leo. Good morning, church. I'm Justin. I'm the senior pastor here, and if you're visiting with us today, I want to extend a special welcome to you and a special greeting to you. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning, and uh, you could worship anywhere, but you chose to be with us, and we're honored by that. So we've got a special worship service today. We're going to talk about the components of discipleship, what it is to be a disciple, but it's, it's far more than informative. That's our intent. Well, and Connie will tell you more about that in just a moment, but my prayer is that it's transformative, that it'll become more than just additional pieces of information that will help us shape our lives. So in preparation for that, let us prepare our hearts to go deeper into worship. Let's pray. Well, good morning, Lord. We thank you for letting us be here today, and thank you for being here with us. We know that we are, you are. We can sense your presence, but Lord, we're so grateful for the fact that we could sense your presence anytime, for you are always with us. Thank you for blessing us and keeping us through the trying times and through the good times, being at our side at all times. Help us to be faithful to you as we live out this covenant of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, your son, and to make others disciples as well. Bless us and keep us in these and all things. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
At the end of that two minutes, a bell will ring, and then the next speaker will come up. This is a time to try to deepen your relationship with God and to ask how he can help you in these areas of discipleship. We start off with Jeff Smith. I've been asked to talk to you about worship, and worship is a, uh, a continuum, if you will. There's a part of worship that we all agree we all agree on what the meaning is. It's something we do, amen? That's what we're here right now doing. We're here worshiping, but at some point it, it extends past that to it becomes not so much what you do as who you are. Let me give you a real quick example of that. I took a, a bunch of kids on a mission trip to um, Birmingham, Alabama several years ago, and one of the rules of the trips was that the kids had to surrender their cell phones. Now, my experience with that had been that they would lie. They would tell me, oh, I didn't bring a cell phone, but you know, they'd keep their cell phones. So uh, long story short, this trip was different. I said, okay, you can keep your cell phone as long as it's not a problem, but I've got to ask the question, you know, if you can't give your cell phone up for just three and a half, four days for Jesus, who owns the, who, who owns the cell phone? Do you own it or does it own you? Well, they all grudgingly gave up their cell phones. That was an act of worship, right? But what made it interesting is by the end of the week, when we had our debriefing session, I gave their cell phones back. One of the, one of the youth leaders, her name was Shelby, and she was just a, a genuine joy of the life to be around. She was one of our leaders. And, and she said, you know, Pastor Jeff, on Tuesday when you took my cell phone, I was cursing your name. <laughs> but today I kind of wonder why I even need the cell phone. That's worship becoming a part of you, and that's the difference. I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but I invite you to, to pray about that for just a, a few minutes. Let's pray. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. In Romans 12, 13, Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. You know, in Romans, it says it twice. I think they want us to get the message. We all are to show hospitality wherever we are, not just at church and not just the greeters on Sunday morning. We all should show hospitality to visitors here at church. We should show hospitality at the checkout lane or the delivery person. We should show hospitality when we're eating out. We should show hospitality at the doctor's office. We should show hospitality wherever we are. 
Let's practice hospitality and make it a way of life. Let us ask God to help open our hearts to find new ways to practice hospitality. Let us pray. Prayer is easy, right? All you have to do is just talk to God. But if it's easy, why have there been thousands of books written about prayer? I know I have one on my Kindle for five years. I still haven't finished. Sometimes it's hard to concentrate. So let's go back to the source of truth. What does Jesus say about prayer? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, he says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. But when you pray, go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. But what do you say? It can be awkward, even if you're by yourself. You know, the disciples struggled with that too. And in Matthew chapter 6 again, verses 7 through 15, Jesus says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray like this, Our Father, who art in heaven, and many of you know the rest of that story. It's the Lord's Prayer. But isn't prayer more than just repeating those words that we were given? Paul provided some thoughts on prayer in his letters. He said, when we worry, become angry, are feel fearful or discouraged in his letter to the Philippines, not Philippines, Philippians, to quickly turn to prayer and in thanksgiving, present our request to God. In Ephesians, he says, prayer should be our first response to every fearful situation, every anxious thought, and every undesired task. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of all of those things. A life filled with prayer is a journey which cannot be rushed. And a life filled with prayer is important because when we don't pray, we depend on ourselves and not on God's grace. Mother Teresa, 
She's not in the Bible, of course, but I have read some about her, and I know someone that actually met her. And you know, she went through a prayer journey too. And here are some of her words about prayer. I used to pray that God would feed the hungry or do this or that, but now I pray that he will guide me to do whatever I'm supposed to do and what I can do. I used to pray for answers, but now I'm praying for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. So let's now take time to pray about our journey with prayer. Let us pray.
Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains of which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, Authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. God's word given to his children. Thanks be to God.
The Bible has a lot to say about doing good works. However, doing good works does not guarantee us salvation, but it certainly shows that we are trying to be like Jesus. Here's one of my favorite passages about serving, James 2, 24 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? There's a popular Christian song out that I enjoy in this uh, paraphrase. It's talking, the songwriter's saying, you know, God, why aren't you taking care of these things in the world? We've got hunger, we've got poverty and all these things. And God said, I did. I created you. Just as Jesus taught that loving and serving others was the right thing to do, let us pray to God that our eyes will be open to ways that we too can serve our neighbors here in our community and around the world. Let us pray that we will not let our self-perceived physical and financial limitations stop us from doing what God has planned for each of us to do. Let us pray. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Matthew 6, 21 reads, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This brings the idea of generosity front and center. Generosity refers not only to financial generosity, but also how generous we are with our time and our talents. God uses generosity to help accomplish his mission on earth. We are his wallet and his hands. He calls us to be generous with our finances, our hospitality, our service, and our prayers. As we generously share our resources, we help to accomplish his works. What is standing in the way of using our resources to accomplish God's works? What holds us back from trusting God with our finances and time? Let's pray.
in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank all of our leadership team that volunteered to do little segments for us. And just thank you so much for your words and your thoughts. Uh, when you came in today, you got this uh, newsletter that uh, talks about the missions and discipleship. And on the back of it, I encourage you, when you have a moment, to, to check this out. But it, it shows the, the results of the surveys that we took. You remember those about a month and a half ago or so? The surveys, the discipleship surveys, it shows where we are as a church, which is a very useful tool, very helpful. And it shows a couple of things. One of the, we have many strengths as a congregation when it comes to some of the things that we've just been talking about. We've got some growing edges. Our strengths are that we take worship pretty seriously, which is pretty cool. Amen? We're, we're very generous as a congregation, also pretty cool. Um, what our growing edges, though, is we're not as biblically literate or grounded in the Word as we could be. So that's a great place for us to focus some of our efforts. I'm so delighted as your pastor that we had a volunteer. Janine, thank you so much for agreeing to help lead our, our upper elementary school kids. We're, we're so grateful for that, that we've got that going for us now. But in summing up all the things that we've talked about so far today, where we are, what we're doing, um, what I would like to point out is uh, the, the why question. Why does it matter? Why are we doing this? Um, I really appreciate one of the things that Jackie said in her uh, presentation about prayer, that we, we pray because not, not so much that things change, but because we pray, we change, and then we affect the change. And you could say that about all of these issues that we've just talked about, amen? amen? That we engage in these things because it changes us, and then we make changes in the world because God uses us. So the why question is, we make ourselves available to God so that we can be the hands and feet of His Son, Jesus. That's why we do what we do. Let me tell you one of the reasons we don't do what we do. We don't come in to a worship service like this when we don't engage in the life of the church to impress each other. It's kind of cool that that happens, but that's not our main objective. That's not being disciple makers. Many years ago, I had a, 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 one of the ladies in the church that after each service would make file out, just kind of like you guys do, and and she would file out one of the things she routinely said at the end of every worship service. Pastor Jeff, that was a lovely service. And I was always grateful for that. And it was always a nice compliment. I'm grateful for when you guys say something like that too. It's always nice. But you know, here's the problem with the focus being on a lovely service that just basically makes us feel good about who we are. The problem is the world we live in isn't the same as it was when most of us grew up. Christianity, my friends, is now has become countercultural. Right? It's not part of the mainstream culture anymore. And when it is, when Christianity is part of the mainstream culture, it's great to have something that is a lovely service, is wonderful. But we don't live in that world anymore. We live in a world that's dramatically different. In his book, Rules for Radical, Saul Alinsky wrote that he who controls the language controls the masses. Uh, I paraphrase a bit, but that's basically what he said. Author George Orwell, in his book, 1984, kind of foreshadowed this world that we live in with his comments that, uh, about how the ruling elite in this dystopian future, they, they played gamesmanship with language and events. They changed history on a whim, not to re-examine the past, but to fit the current narrative, whatever whatever that was, so that they could stay in power. That, that's the world we live in. We live in a world where criminals, are, criminals are, are no longer called criminals. They're called justice-involved persons. I, I still can't figure that out, but... We live in a world where uh, the, the idea of gender is under question, and it's no longer a binary choice. It's no longer a this or that, an XY chromosome or an XX chromosome. It's no longer that. Gender can be anything you want it to be. And if you argue otherwise based on the science of biology, it's not that you're coming from a different point of view, it's that you're a bigot somehow. That's the world we live in. We live in a world where we can watch a news report with a reporter standing in front of a burning building and saying, this was mostly a peaceful protest. That's the world we live in. 
We, we live in a world that Isaiah would have been probably comfortable with when he talked about this back in the day. And he said, we, woe betide us when we, we put salt for sweet and call evil good. That's the world we live in. Everything is upside down. Which goes, goes back to the why. This is so important. Why we need to do what we need to do. Why we, why we need to become better and more biblically literate and, and biblically grounded. Why we need to worship more fervently. Why we need to share these, these truths that we hold to be dear with others. Because we live in a, a world where the truth is fluid. It is a construct rather than an absolute. But I would, I would suggest this to you. I, I would propose this. That if you're a follower of Jesus... That you can't be an effective follower of Jesus unless you believe that he meant what he said when he said certain things. And one of those things is that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, in this world we live in, when we, we play games with language, that's, that's a pretty provocative statement, isn't it? Because it's exclusionary. It's exclusive. It's saying that the Muslims won't make it, the Hindus won't make it, Etc. Etc. And you know what? Here's here's the hard truth. That is what it means. It is exclusionary. But I want to suggest a couple of other things too. The truth claims that that other worldviews have are equally exclusionary. Now here's the thing about that. Why it's important for us to be grounded in all of these things that we just talked about today. Here's the truth of why this is important. We can be wrong, and those who disagree with us can be wrong. All of us can be wrong. But we can't all be right. Amen? There's the logic to that, right? So the only question I have for you is, if you have to stake your life on something, if you have to bet, literally bet your life on something, what are you willing to bet your life on? For me, I'm going to bet on Jesus. I'm going to bet that he meant it when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father through me. I'm willing to lay my life down on that one. Because if I'm wrong, what have I really lost? If I'm wrong, what have I lost? If with the last breath of my life, I discover that, nah, it wasn't so true. But I live my life in a much better way because I believe in these truths. What have I lost? Now, the thing is, I don't think I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure I'm right. That's why I'm willing to bet my life on it. But we live in a world where that, that truth is pretty much camouflaged. It's pretty much distorted. It's pretty much vilified. And if we, as Jesus followers, aren't equipped to correct the record, who will? Now, how do we correct that record? Well, we correct the record by how we live our lives, right? The story I told you about Shelby, the youth that we worked with so long ago in, in Birmingham, Alabama, that she, is an act of worship. She gave up her cell phone for three and a half, four days. Reluctantly, she would admit that if she were here today. But by Friday, she discovered that she was putting her, and I, I, these are my words, not hers, I want to be clear about that. But she transitioned from somebody who, who participated in worship as something she did to being worship being a part of her life when she realized that she was putting her cell phone ahead of God. And then she kind of turned her cell phone into an idol. We can't do that. But we're human beings as Jesus followers. Being Jesus followers doesn't make us any less human. Amen? And we could fall into those traps just as easy as anybody else, unless, unless we pray. Unless we worship as part of who we what we are rather than something that we occasionally do. Unless we're generous. Unless we're hospitable. And that anybody who walks through the doors of our worship services or our homes are equally welcome no matter who they are, what they are, what they look like, or where they come from. Unless we are are bold in our witness. It doesn't mean you have to evangelize on street corners. I mean, who likes those guys, right? You don't have to do that. Although, if you feel led to, you should. But we do have to be bold about who we are. 
Because friends, I, I will guarantee you this, that in this countercultural reality that we live in as Jesus followers and in the world around us where, where the truth is a fluid concept rather than an absolute, people are starved for the truth. I want you to hear me say that again. People are starved for something that's true, something that's consistent, something that they can hang on to, something that, that, that's going to be as true as the sun coming up in the east every morning and setting in the west every evening. People are hungry for that. And I want to guarantee you something. When people look at us as, uh, as truly committed Jesus followers and we proclaim this truth that we're literally willing to die for, they might not agree with us. <laughs> But they're watching us. And I guarantee you they're thinking, I, I don't know, those Christians may be all left. But man, look at how much they believe in what they say. Those Christians have some pretty wacky notions about reality, but man, look at how they love each other so unconditionally. The world is watching that. And, and once more, friends, I tell you with God is my witness that the world desperately needs that. And if not us, who? And if not now, when? So here's my prayer for us as a congregation as we ponder what we've been doing with discipleship, what we're continuing to do. And by the way, if you haven't finished your survey yet, or, or you, you had to have it revised, and you haven't gotten it back to Debbie yet, it's not too late. We'd still love to have those. We'd love to, to tabulate those as part of the results. But here's my prayer for us as we continue this exercise, as we prepare to go deeper with the next step, is that, that we take it to heart, not just as one more interesting thing that we do to impress each other, or to show how much we love each other, but as something we do that has equipped us for the spiritual warfare that God is calling us to engage in. That this is basic training, really. For this cultural war that wages all around us, for which God is calling us to get in the fight. And it's a preparation so that we can be equipped to do what God is calling us to do. To be disciples and disciple makers. That's my prayer for all of us. Let's pray. There have been so many things talked about this morning, Lord, like generosity and service and Bible study and scripture and prayer and hospitality and worship and all of those things that are so important in what it is to be a disciple and to encourage others to be disciples as well. But the one thing that unites them all is that by engaging in these things as disciples, our lives are changed and we are transformed. And then, only then, can we be of service to others. Change is painful. Change is hard. I'm not so old that I don't remember what physical growing pains were like. And you're never too old to know what emotional growing pains were like. But Lord, when you're in the mix, it's all for the good. So as we answer the call, I know that you'll equip us and prepare us to do what it is that you've called us to do. And now I ask for your blessing. I'm not ashamed to ask for it. And I'm humble enough to know how much I need it and how much we need it. So Lord, we ask for your blessing. Bless us and keep us in these endeavors and all other things. And all of God's people said,
We all get called to one ministry or the other. What's your ministry? What's your dream? What have you been called to? That's something to pray about. So pray about it. That's something to embrace, so embrace it. So go from this place knowing that God has called you into the fight. God has called you into the mix. God has called you to be a part of this countercultural revolution called Jesus Christ. And he has equipped you and he has encouraged you. So go in peace knowing that that is true. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.